We are inspired by the idea of going to Mars, not just to visit, but to live, work, and play. But the journey there is not going to be easy. In fact, the journey to space in general can be a very difficult one. Uh, at what point do you think Starship will be ready to start carrying people? If, I tend to be, as, as you know, I tend to be somewhat optimistic with respect to schedules. Uh, um, I, f I feel I should acknowledge this. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so take that with a grain of salt. But um, I, th I think it's not out of the question that it could be ready to fly, cr fly people in a couple of years. Okay. Obviously, we need, we need to, like, not be making craters, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, otherwise, it's like, hop in, we're, we're going to Mars. No, not quite, not yet. <laughs> Technological advancements to be a space-faring civilization get a lot of the limelight but we don't often talk about the mental struggles of going to space. I met up with Jason Michaud, who founded Stardust Technologies. He flew into Johnson Space Center from Canada to meet with me and told me more about his company. Okay, Ellie in space here at the Johnson Space Center, joined by Jason Michaud, and you're from Canada. Yes. <sighs> so we want to share an exciting announcement with my subscribers. So let's talk about a little bit about the Stardust Festival. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, so, so the Stardust Festival got started last year, and it's basically a festival to bring uh, indigenous youth and rural youth into the space industry, where um, we're basically in a community that doesn't really get access to that. Um, so we're really in a place where they tell us as kids growing up, you're in forestry or mining, and that's it. That's the mindset. And I, I guess some, some places in the U.S. live kind of similar mindset. So we started the festival, kind of the spark to get those kids into it. Stardust specializes in AI, robotics, and STEM education, and has most recently worked in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency and the National Research Council of Canada on what's called the Eden Project. Here they're trying to create a solution utilizing virtual reality neural systems and haptic feedback in lunar, Martian, and microgravity environments. This will help astronauts cope with their mental health during time on the International Space Station, space habitats, and during space exploration. Jason broke into the aerospace industry about five years ago, but he has another mission to help bridge the gap between underserved kids and the space industry. So a lot of times space uh, feels unachievable because it, it is something that feels like it's so far out for some of the communities. Uh, because we, we always associate it with like rocket scientists because that, that whole thing is like uh, you, you got to be a rocket scientist to get into space but that's not true. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to be in space. You can be anyone from any walks of life, especially with the private space industry. Um, and uh, we're, we're really trying to break down that barrier. A lot of time when we go to our indigenous communities, we're making it as youth activities so that we can ease uh, the, uh, the youth and the communities uh, to get into it because a lot of times when we talk about sciences, a lot of the parents won't even bring their kids because they think, oh, that's too much for our kids. We even get, when we do our events, uh, basically kids come to us and they're like, oh, I can't go to university, I'm not smart enough for that. And that, it's got to go down. That barrier's got to go down so that we encourage our youth and foster them into being a, knowing that they're smart enough to do it. We go through generational thinking, uh, as in we're not just doing the STEM, but we're basically uh, creating um, a, a pathway so that these kids are able to uh, to, um, to to basically create capacity in the community. So we started with Metogamy First Nation, the start of space center, so that the kids are able to work in their own community without having to go to the big cities and work in a cultural uh, environment that fosters their, their traditional ways so that they're not losing the, the uh, members of the communities. And uh, we are encouraging uh, members of uh, the uh, the aerospace communities to come establish themselves at the space center uh, way up in the north so that we're not only doing the STEM for the little kids but we're thinking about them when they're in college and university but then providing the opportunity so that they're not just abandoned afterwards. So I, I originally come from Zbreville in between Wall and White River, Ontario closer to the Sault Ste. Marie uh, in the Michigan border and um, this village it was less than 100 people and Basically, uh, it was just about forestry growing up. 
there was no other opportunities. I never really thought I'd get into aerospace myself because it's just so far out, right? Uh, when you're you're growing up, you're told like, hey, you're gonna go in forestry and that's it. And I was the, one of the first ones in my family to graduate high school and to go to college in computer sciences. Again, at that point, I didn't. I got discouraged. A lot of people told me like, oh, you. You're, you can't go in computer science, even IT is something that's taboo in the north almost, right? So um, I am stubborn like my grandfather was. I wanted to prove them wrong and uh, I started my own business uh, in the north uh, in IT and software and a lot of people told me you're not going to last more than six months and uh, basically spinning on that negativity, I wanted to, sp uh, to turn it into positivity and uh, create opportunities for the kids and the next generations that are coming. Um, and I, I really got to uh, be exposed a lot to the indigenous community through my, uh, my adoptive father from Ishkot and First Nation uh, growing up. And uh, we were all facing the similar struggles. We're telling our kids that they can't do stuff because they're from a specific location. Well, instead of sending the kids away, why not bring the aerospace industry to us? And that's really uh, my ambition and what I always wanted to do uh, for the kids because of my upbringing. So we started in uh, aerospace through um, studying uh, ways to help astronauts cope with mental health through haptic feedback and virtual reality so that we can have an uh, astronaut hug their loved one from space and uh, also have their, uh, lo uh, their um, loved one on Earth be able to do the same thing. So essentially through haptic feedback, uh, you'd be able to feel the hug almost in real time from space to help them cope with the mental health struggle. Before COVID, no one really wanted to talk about it, but essentially uh, the uh, mental health component is a giant uh, factor into exploring and establishing uh, communities on Mars. Uh, it's been a pretty great journey, meeting a lot of interesting people and really uh, making a lot of great friends along the way and allies to, to, to really create our space center uh, in the north and uh, really find ways that we can break the norm because in Canada, Canada, it's really discouraged to be an aerospace company when you're a startup company. Uh, it's always about uh, if you have like the, the money to do like uh, to bid on the million dollar projects, but not all the companies are starting. So we've been really creating this grassroots movement of uh, startup companies in Canada that have been uh, uh, really changing the industry thanks to all the, the work of the private space industry in the U.S. as well. That's why he's putting on the Stardust Festival. And as you can see, it has support from astronauts at the ISS. The Stardust Festival, taking place in Timmins, Ontario, Canada, is set to witness the convergence of space and Earth. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of the Space Foundation, Stardust, NASA, and the Canadian Space Agency. This festival serves as a vibrant celebration of Indigenous culture, while also shedding light on mental health conditions, and acts as a platform for fostering connections between Canadian aeronautics, aerospace, and defence industries, to the indigenous and rural northern youth. Hey guys, I'm breaking in here with another late exciting announcement from Stardust. Jason and the Stardust committee have decided to give everyone who pre-registers for the Stardust Festival a raffle entry for a zero-g flight. Space fans rejoice you could win an experience like no other on Earth, a parabolic flight like this one with Jason Michaud on board a Dassault Falcon 20. We all want to go to space and we all want to experience weightlessness. I mean, who hasn't dreamed of being able to fly and being weightless in space? I myself also have an upcoming zero G flight with the Moondow community in October. Very looking forward to that. But you too can have a chance at a zero G flight. All you have to do is pre-register for the Stardust Festival at stardust-festival.com. And remember, admission to the festival is free. So all you have to do is sign up and you too could be going zero G. There will be close to 15 completely free STEM activities for kids to get hands-on practice in this field. Everything from aviation, robotics, controlling rovers, and even launching rockets. Uh, from the Monday to the Friday, it's basically rocketry the whole time. So we have students launching rockets up to 60,000 feet up in the air. And this is uh, our second year doing that uh, with Launch Canada and it's uh, 
something that's never been done in Canada. We were the first ones to do it in Canadian history last year. There will also be 10 to 40 foot rockets on display for kids to see and students to showcase and give technical talks. The Stardust Festival is the largest Indigenous STEM event in Timmins, Ontario, and it runs from August 25th to September 1st. Uh, we also have the Launch Canada competition, uh, which is bringing college and university students from a grassroots movement from across Canada. Uh, there's over a thousand students in that field and believe it or not, we don't really have a rocketry industry in Canada that much. It's still growing and uh, it's really to foster that innovation and opportunities for those kids. Awesome. And about how, so this is your second year? Yes. How many people showed up last year? Uh, we had 250 people for an entire week and this year we're close to a thousand people coming in person. Wow. And where is this held? So it is held in Timmins, Ontario, about eight hours north of uh, Toronto, Ontario. So for those that don't know, uh, Toronto is the capital of, uh, of Ontario and the biggest city in Canada and most of the Canadian population lives out there. So you can combine Texas and Montana, you have Ontario basically. So everything's so remote up there, there's not much population. <laughs> so the uh, Stardust Festival starts with the kickoff opening at uh, uh, the Sportsplex in Collège Boreal and Timmins where we have the uh, uh, our, our keynote speakers from the Canadian Space Agency and the, the government and then at the Stardust Festival, uh, we are going to have all our storytellers sharing their stories about their perspective, how they got to space, uh, to the space industry, how they uh, really uh, struggle, some uh, their struggles, their um, mental resilience, and what helped them in their uh, their hard times to get to where they're at. Because not everyone just put on the podium, uh, not everyone just or overnight success, and that's what we want to show to the kids, that they're able to see themselves in these people. One of those storytellers is Ralph Grau. He is a longtime NASA employee and one of the speakers at the Stardust Festival. So our, our participation, our focus really is motivating future explorers. And so working with Stardust, who's also working with the Space Foundation, they're trying to touch uh, the indigenous populations of our countries. And Canada and America enjoy a long-term relationship in space, mm -hmm. going back to the shuttle days and more. And so we thought it was great to all, all of us participate in Stardust, which the focus is to really introduce and motivate and inspire a young generation to become space explorers like I have been for 33 plus years. At the same time, it's a career fair where uh, companies like Raytheon or MDA uh, are able to, uh, uh, in Lockheed Martin, are able to uh, hire some of those kids. And last year, we had close to 30 uh, students that got hired right on the spot. So it's a really great way to, to bring them right to the front of the industry. For NASA and for CSA, diversity is a, a primary goal. Uh, how do you bring diversity of thought to really have the best solutions come up, right? So that they're most efficient and most effective solutions, because space is a hard place to be in. <laughs> and so this region of Canada has a large indigenous population. And so again, it, it helps bring to a part of their uh, public that doesn't normally get introduced to their possibilities in space. Leading that in the evening, we have a Yuri's Night that uh, really um, is part of our gala that aims to uh, get the older uh, students to, to meet with the, uh, uh, the um, partners in the industry, uh, for whether it's NASA, CSA, MDA, so that they're able to really understand and network and see the capabilities. Uh, and have a good uh, networking time, uh, leading to our Indigenous Celebrations Day on the Sunday, which basically focuses on bringing the uh, cultural differences and cultural awareness so that people can better understand and how can they work with our Indigenous communities and how can we make it easier. You've been with NASA for over 30 years, so what are some of the best ways you think to inspire kids to get interested in STEM? The, when I reach out to kids, what I tell them is, get to know your why, what really drives you. Now, for me, I love helping others, being of service. And what we do at NASA has the potential of helping the whole world. Yeah. So very few jobs can connect that way to my why. Uh, and so, and I tell kids, you know, we hire everyone. I've got as many, I've got lots of scientists and lots of engineers. I've got doctors and lawyers and accountants as well. I probably have an order of magnitude more scientists and engineers than the others. 
So if you want to work for NASA or you want to work for Canadian Space Agency, you can contribute. Right. But if really if you want to get into the rocket science of it, then science and uh, engineering are really the way to connect to the potential of really being that ultimate rocket scientist. But Jason's mission doesn't stop there. In fact, he has invited me along for a very unique opportunity a little later in the year, and I can't wait to share it with you. So November will mark the first uh, analog crewed mission in the Serenity Station, uh, a 20 crewed uh, member analog uh, mission, which basically it's a uh, compromise of four uh, different geodesic domes. Con uh, con um, you're fine. Uh, so it's comprised of four geodesic domes that are interconnected so that uh, you, you can basically have a crew of 20 people uh, interacting from different walks of life because the big thing is we're planning on sending uh, about 40 to 100 people to the moon eventually and by having that you're going to have so much diversity and you need to study every aspect of civilization uh, and crew dynamics and the human factor because that's the biggest challenge. You can't just put someone that's from the mining industry on the moon with someone that's purely an engineer. They might not get along with each other so we got to find how do we mitigate those risks and how can we uh, really uh, find ways that work best before sending humans out there. We have the technology to put people on the moon and to live on the moon. It's just that human factor has got to be studied a lot more. And uh, we're very excited to be the largest uh, crude analog that will be focusing on the human factor first and foremost. Uh, the first crude mission is going to be a seven-day uh, mission, which is more focused on the setup. It's a lunar mission. Uh, we have the um, one of the best anorthosite um, similar um, of the moon, the Apollo 16 craters, uh, nearby Timmins, and this is all in the traditional lands of autogamy space. Uh, Autogamy First Nation uh, at the start of Space Center, and we're very excited uh, to, to be sharing that because that's going to be, uh, we can't wait to, to do this because we're going to be doing a lot of groundbreaking uh, technology testing and researches with a lot of the university, and this is really open to everyone around the world. Right, do you have your full crew selected? Yes, we do. <laughs> and we who's have the first crew? And, and am I on that crew? Of course you are. <laughs> so crazy. So, am I going to be like the reporter aspect? You will be. That is uh, so the, cool. The, the social influence. We need to bring everyone uh, yeah. on, on board uh, because if we are just making space the way it is traditionally, we're going to have encounters with a lot of barriers, and we need to make space open to everyone. That yeah. includes uh, social media influencers, content creators, right? Uh, even firefighters and policing in the down uh, in the down. Uh, mm -hmm down the line uh, because if we don't do that how are we going to tell people what space is all about and you are one of these amazing people that can share the story about space and we need that because if people do not understand we're just going to have unfortunately a lot more people that believe that it's fake and I get that on a day-to-day -day basis people think that the earth's flat or the moon landing never happened especially since COVID and we've got to break those stigmas and show to people that it's true it's there Yes. And uh, we're the people that are going to do it, and you guys are the storytellers that will uh, inspire the next generation. Um, and uh, it's just going to keep growing as uh, we're building the capabilities, and uh, we encourage these youths to get involved in uh, rocketry and uh, really uh, break the boundaries of this grassroots movement. All right, so I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. And again, if you want to learn more information about Stardust, you can find their website at Stardust. Uh, Dash, uh, festival .com. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to like it, subscribe to Ellie in Space, and I guess you're going to see me on an analog mission, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm.